So just starting at the back, sir. Kia ora. Uh, my question relates to the topic that's on, it's relating to the challenge and dispute process regarding the EQC contract supervisor appointment. So who determines how they're appointed and how do we get it changed? I.e. how do I get my current con contract supervisor changed? Because all of our issues I believe stem back to everything from the dual assessment. So how the contract, so how's the EQR contract supervisor appointed? Yeah, good question. I have to say, uh, given the volume of work that we've had over the last four years, 67 or so thousand repairs, each of them needing a contract supervisor, there's not a lot of science that's gone in behind how a contract supervisor is appointed. They just, they get given work as repairs come available to them. I think you, your main issue is you're not happy with the current contract supervisor and how do you get them uh, switched out? I think that's what your, that's your question, your main question. Can we have a talk about that after this? Because, uh, I mean, the answer to that is you, you could either go back to EQR and raise your concerns with them. Have you had an opportunity to do that? No luck? So then I think probably having discussion with someone like me or Paula, you probably um, have more luck doing it that way. I mean, but to answer your question, there's no, there's no magic formula to how they are appointed. Um, there's about a hundred, there was about 125 of them um, managing a number of repairs. And I think it's, it's just a, as your number comes up, contract supervisor appointed to a job. Yep. Thank you. So coming into the hub and talking to someone here and raising that as an issue uh, and, and getting that discussion mooted from here, I think was a, a response initially but maybe have a chat to Mark after this as well. Thanks for that, Mark. So coming forwards. Um, we've talked about foundation damage, but framing damage. How is framing damage assessed or investigated? Thanks for that. Um, framing damage is, uh, obviously we can't see it. So we're using our experience to gauge whether we believe there is damage there. If we can't, if we believe there's um, no damage, then we really would be looking for yourselves as customers to prove your loss. Um, because it's unrealistic to expect EQC to start removing linings to check framing across this whole event. Now look, we're you, we are using our experience um, as builders to identify these, and if we believe that there is a necessity to remove linings, we will. But if we don't believe there is, we'll be looking back to our customers to prove their loss and expose that framing and the damage. I think that's a fair way to go forward, um, um, and, and I don't believe that that's unrealistic, uh, putting, putting that onus on back onto the customer. Um, but again, please talk to your EQC, your supervisor, and discuss it with them and just raise what your concerns are. Yep. Um, one of the most difficult questions that has arisen is where does EQC's duty to assess stop and where does the homeowner's duty to undertake their, their own inquiries start? And there has to be a line drawn somewhere, but in many situations, there's, it's quite arguable that where a homeowner incurs expense in detecting earthquake damage, that th there should be at least some contribution to those expenses where those inquiries were necessary. All right, so I think, um, again, it's a question which has been asked many times, and I think seeking advice uh, you know, responses if experienced builders say uh, they have a look at the wall or, and they, they can't see anything, they can't justify a reason for taking the line off to go further investigate, but you think there is, seek some advice about how you're going to go about that without incurring lots of costs. Get some information, I think, is the response that we've just heard. So thank you. Just coming forward. Yeah. Oh, so, yes, sir. Hello, I'm uh, 
in a multi-unit dwelling. We were re-scoped uh, October, November last year, including an engineer. Now I presume in the interim, designs are being done and costings are being sought by EQR. What happens to that work if, if it goes over cap? Does that get passed on to the insurance company? Yeah, listen, we're, we're more than happy to share our findings and engineers' reports with them. Um, there is a little bit of a, uh, grey area is not the right word, but when, it, when an engineer, say for example an EQR engineer, uh, does some assessment and comes up with a repair strategy and hands that over to the insurance company, who may then start using their engineers, it, there's a little bit of a proper handoff that needs to take place between engineers and it all relates to professional liabilities and indemnities and what have you but um, I think your question is do we share, uh, are, will we give information about a, an earthquake damage to the insurers? Yes, if they think it's of value. Yes ma'am. Um, is it acceptable to live in a home um, where it continually vibrates as traffic goes past once it's been repaired. Yeah, that's a very tricky question because um, I'm aware I, customers raise this quite often with me and um, physically you may not have damage to your house but it has issues with the land and obviously with traffic going past it is still um, vibrating through. Um, is a very hard one to sort of um, resolve. I suppose living down here myself for the last uh, four years, I'm, I'm aware that my perception of um, vibrations, anything going on is a lot higher than what it ever used to be. And so I don't really have an answer to that question. Um, Yes, I am saying it's more of a land issue, um, but very hard to resolve. Because at the end of the day, we can do everything to the building, but it's, if it's still travelling through the land, vibrating, um, and, and again, it can be sometimes your perception that you're picking up things, and, and I'm aware of it. Um, yes, it's a very um, difficult one to resolve. So who would I go and talk to? <laughs> Probably... Um, I'd be almost saying TNT, uh, may be able to give some explanation. Um, perhaps we can uh, try and find the answer to that question for you. From a legal perspective, the first question is whether or not the original damage is earthquake damage. And then if it was earthquake damage, the second question is whether or not that damage has been repaired or remediated to the standard in the Earthquake Commission Act, which the primary standard is substantially the same as its condition when new. So I think another question to ask is whether or not it was vibrating prior to the earthquakes. And if it wasn't, then I would recommend further investigations and perhaps coming to see RAS. All right, okay, so have a visit there. That's tough, isn't it? Okay, all right, thanks for the question. Coming back on this side. Ma'am? Yes. Um, do EQC have a criteria for when they, for what they consider that a scope has not been adequately done? For example, if they haven't inspected an area or they've been unable to inspect an area, can they then put no damage? Right, so for example, like under a house or in a roof, is that what you're, uh, um, any examples here to a, help with that? In, in a, yeah, in a garage. Um, okay. Yeah. If there's... Um, 
possibility that we cannot get into an area um, that would probably fall back onto a customer to have a, to come back to us and say uh, to prove their loss in that area. Like if we are saying a garage that's got contents in there and we physically can't get in there to inspect, then at this stage we have to just put it down as uh, uh, no no damage but not being able to be inspected. Um, sometimes that will be include a uh, roof space and under floors. Um, again, I think. No, I don't want to um, out rule out anything that's because it's possible there is damage there, but certainly just raise the point that it hasn't been inspected. Um, it needs to be inspected, but we need to work together to try and get to a resolution on these sort of things. Um, if we can't get access um, into something like a ceiling space, um, and again, and there's no actual physical damage to the linings or roof coverings, um, and there's no rationale that we sort of start uh, assuming that there's damage up there, then we would put down no damage. Okay. And what about EQC's own, own criteria? Do they have a criteria for what they consider themselves that the scope's perhaps not been adequately done? Uh, well, I think um, our own criteria, I'm not too sure I we'll quite get the gist of the question, but um, if, if there's areas of concern, then they need to be raised and we need to reinvestigate. Okay. Yep. Thank you. I, I think um, it, it's fair to say that the vast majority of the way we do our assessments is based on visual inspections. So coming back to this lady's point of view about um, in, internal frames, unless there's some clear evidence that the house is racked, for example, that suggests that there's something a problem with the framing, then we would assume that in lieu of, or in the absence of any obvious visual evidence, that there is no earthquake damage. That would be ordinarily the conclusion we would draw. However, if you're of the view that, for example, your garage or a room it does have earthquake damage in it and that we have missed it, then you should bring that to our attention and we will come back and have a look at it again. And that's, if you, re you remember, one of the reasons, one of the common reasons for disagreements with the EQC is around the scope. So a customer has a view that X, Y and Z is earthquake damage and we might have only picked up X and Y. Um, so you need to bring our attention to the other part of that. Thank you. And as repeating before, you can come and make appointments here uh, with the contact team and get that conversation started. Sir. Question to Mark, bearing in mind coming back to the framing issue of the lady over there. Uh, when there's a case where um, both the repair strategy and returns of the MBIE and Tonkin and Taylor's information has a position where um, lining should be removed and bearing in mind if EQC is following those recommendations, why is it that EQC, EQR will then not follow those recommendations? So am I understanding right, sort of there are guidelines and maybe it suggests that lining should be taken off in certain circumstances but EQR is not. So there's a conflict there, that question. I have to say I haven't read the guidelines line by line. I'm not sure. Do they recommend that we should be removing linings? I, I, mean, I, get, I guess I come back to the, my answer again. We're, we're looking for evidence of earthquake damage and if that required us to remove the linings then that's what we should be doing, but uh, there'd have to be some pretty strong evidence that we'd want to be seeing you know, some quite large cracks from walls, possibly walls out of plum, for example. Sorry, you'll see me. Right, okay, sure. Thanks. Thanks, sir. Ma'am? Oh, okay, over on this side. Ma'am? Um, when something has quite clearly been missed off a scope of works, like a massive crack in the foundations, um, 
I believe that we need to get our own independent sin to prove this to you guys. Um, now, if that is so, this is for my mother-in-law's house I'm talking about. If I think about my own house, I too have had to have my own independent in for my, founda my foundations. The other day when I was here talking to an EQC guy, he basically said it's not worth the, the paper it's wrote on because EQC don't like this guy. Um, it's cost me $2,000, this report. But yet, in the, the website, there's nothing telling me who I am allowed to contact and who I'm not. I don't want to go and spend another $2,000 of my mother-in-law's money for to be told it's not worth it. So, so if a comment was made to you by one of our staff that we don't like this guy, that was inappropriate, it, it should have been said, it shouldn't have been said. Um, what we are, so, so we get a lot of engineering reports being sent by customers to us. And it's fair to say they range in quality. There's some really good engineering reports out there that really um, uh, a focus on the earthquake damage and they make recommendations about repair strategies that are in keeping with the building code. Um, they're in, in line with the MB guidelines. Um, and, and they uh, recommend a repair strategy that we can do under our act. Now, unfortunately, not all engineering reports um, are as good a quality as that. It's fair that there, are, there are a minority out there that uh, miss the mark in terms of the way they're assessing earthquake damage or the recommendations they're making. And so when we get those coming across our desk, there's, sometimes there's not a lot of value in them for us. Perhaps they're not being prescriptive enough about what the repair needs to be. Possibly they're overstating um, what the repair strategy should be. So for want of a better word, they're gold plating and the making recommendations that are, are well beyond what we can do under the terms of our act. So, so we, we, get, we get the whole spectrum of engineering reports and I think the challenge for you is you've potentially ended up with an engineering report which, now I haven't seen it, I don't, know, I don't know what your circumstances are, but perhaps doesn't tell us what we need to know. And so I think your next question was, well, what, who, which engineers should you use? I'd like to be able to stand here and rattle off a list for you, but it's inappropriate for me to do that. There are some really good firms out there and there are other firms out there or other engineers out there that are perhaps new to Christchurch and aren't familiar with earthquake damage conditions. Perhaps not so much nowadays because, you know, in the early days that may have been the case. But um, like all professions, we get some, and there's a, there's a range of quality out there that come across our, our desk. But can I, perhaps, can I talk to you afterwards and understand a little bit more about your circumstances? So I just want to say that if you do commission an engineer to do a report for you and it is of the quality that, that we um, need to get and we, we use that report in some way to amend your settlement, then we are open to looking at meeting the costs of that report. Okay. It is on a case by case, um, but if, if we get value from that report and it does lead to the right outcome for the customer, then we do look on a case by case at reimbursing. Um, and I think you started off by saying that you had to get someone in to actually pick up missed damage, um, my advice would be, um, as Mark already said, if you think the scope's missing damage from, from the SOUR, um, call us first. Don't go to independent because you may actually be spending money you don't need to. Um, I'd just like to say that if you send your own engineer's report to EQC and it gets knocked back, one option that you have is to come into RAS and submit it to our technical panel who will peer review it and give advice as to whether or not um, the recommendations in the report should be followed. And that is a free service, so that's one option that is available to people out there. But I would stress that there is still value in engaging your own experts because our panel will give advice in accordance with the MB guidelines and with the building code, because that's their brief, but the standard in the Earthquake Commission Act may be higher than that. And so if you engage your own engineer, you can ask them to provide you with a report 
to the standard that's in the Earthquake Commission Act. We, while we don't have a list, we have a lot of dealings with EQC. For example, we, out of our 800 cases which are currently open, 400 of them are with EQC. And from our experiences, we have learned which engineering reports have been afforded considerable weight and which engineering reports have been afforded less weight. Um, certainly I could give you some names of some people that we've used that have provided good results. All right. Thank you, John, and uh, uh, Mark and Michael for those responses. All right. Ma'am, yes. Mine's just a quick question. Um, I've had three scopes done. Um, one was from uh, an unregistered engineer who works for EQR. She wasn't registered. She wasn't CPENS, IPENS. Told me that there was no damage to my house. Now I've had three reports done that I've had to pay for. And now there is damage to the house and I'm still no further forward. So do you guys still use unregistered uh, engineers to make decisions on people's repairs? Uh, we use builders to make decisions on uh, people's repairs. Our, our, so for non-structural elements, typically we will use uh, builders. So uh, uh, you know, the, the, the guys that are in Grant's team, they're not engineers. They're all mostly builders by, by trade. So they will, and, and imagine many of you have met them, they're out there assessing damage, deciding what repair strategies are appropriate. Uh, in the example you're talking about, um, if, if anything is, any engineering designs are done by EQR, whilst they might have been done by an engineer who's not registered, they should be signed off by a colleague who is registered. So there be some sort of peer review process going on there. So only engineers can sign off proper engineer design works. So can we talk afterwards? Could be a long afternoon. <laughs> All right, and thanks for that question and catch Mark, after this, um, just coming over to the, the other side here, please, Sarah. Ma'am. Uh, yeah, we hear a lot about uh, foundation problems, and I was wondering uh, some time ago, I was told that when people come around, a, a team comes around to have a check at the foundation, they were not allowed to lift the carpet. And the last time they came to my place, uh, the carpet is very old now, by now, and I just cut it in two, and I said, here we are. And it was really uh, quite a serious, uh, uh, damage in, in, the, in the foundation, and before that, they hadn't. I think they hadn't seen it at all. So it's about finding damage late down the track. Is that the question? What do you do about that? Is that your question? Yeah, I mean, I just uh, I cut the carpet in two, and I said, "Here you are. That, that, that's where it is." You know. The carpets are a bit of a, a, a challenging area for us, and normally we're pretty reluctant to lift them mm. because we lift them. We try and put them back down again, yeah. and they don't go down properly. Or if they're old carpets, they'll tear and rip. Mm. And then the homeowner's standing there going, well, you've just ripped or torn my carpet. What are you going to do about it? So, um, so uh, for us to be lifting carpet, we'd want some pretty um, clear evidence of other elements in the dwelling that are showing that the foundation is probably badly cracked. Yeah. The, the, the so, so it was wise. Your yeah. course of action was wise to do, but normally we're pretty reluctant to do it for that reason. Well, I think um, so. You found a big crack in, in your floor, and oh, yeah, what? Made now and, everything, yeah. and so the status of your claim have we have they been sent to us? And yeah, there's still a problem. You know. Okay, great. Yeah. Okay. 